Good morning, um, everyone. Good morning from Warsaw. I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome uh, everyone to the series of webinars. A special gratitude goes, of course, to co-host of today's series, um, uh, Azure Research Center, and of course, to three eminent scholars uh, from different parts of the world, from different expertise. Uh, Professor Shin Kawashima, connecting us from Tokyo, who's started sophisticated research on Chinese manuscripts and now is a leading expert on China in international relation, who has also personal experience uh, and witnessed activity, Chinese activity in from first Asia to Africa. Um, then we have Professor Richard Griffiths from Hanseatic port of Leiden, uh, who is um, also a, a, an expert of maritime belt and road initiative and has a special focus on Southern Asia. Um, we, with what we connect with Mr. Yehud Gonen, um, who from business and diplomacy, fortunately for us, uh, has joined academia and became a maritime policy and strategy research center researcher. Uh, welcome again. And let's start with Professor Shin's area um, expertise of well, predominantly Southeast Asia, but of course you have like global view on those processes. Um, the floor is yours. So I can start, right? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm Shin Kawashima. I'm teaching at the University of Tokyo. Uh, my specialization is Chinese diplomacy and diplomatic history. So uh, it's uh, it's all, um, this is a great honor uh, of me to invite to be invited here to discuss about the Chinese global strategy and on the port. Uh, today I, I share the slide um, with you. Uh, the this slide, yes, and. Uh, Yes, um, my present time of presentation is just ten, only 10 minutes. So uh, I uh, as, uh, introduce the, uh, my uh, presentation uh, generally. And also I today, I talk about the yes Chinese, their own uh, strategy uh, on the part. Um, it is the, uh, I, I, at first I introduce the Chinese uh, discourses on the, um, the strategy on the port, it's about China you know, uh, get some ports in Europe and all over the, all the world. Uh, this uh, uh, news on the website said that China controls 63 strategic key ports in the world. US, US military service and the US government feels threatened seriously from such a Chinese expansion. This is the second case of second, a second, second, second case. Uh, the the, the Chinese, as I just in the, the content in Chinese, China controls seven largest ports in the world. How does China control maritime key ports? How large impact does it, it have? It, it, sorry, it has, sorry, sorry. And the other news says that, the how does China become a great maritime power? China controls, 33 ports of 453 global largest ports. So these discourses are very, very uh, affirmative and positive uh, that China got China control control the ports. Uh, all uh, many, many uh, important key ports in the world. Then uh, it is also the uh, discourse in China. China has already China has already controlled eight largest ports so that China becomes great and major power soon. Is also and this all the, the, the cases are uh, put in this uh, couple of years, maybe 2021, 20, 20, 20, 23, 23. And how about the Chinese strategy, maritime strategy in this, couple, in this uh, couple of decades? This is a basic, basic policy uh, on, uh, designed in 1994, a Chinese maritime 20th century agenda. Okay. Uh, designed in 1994, and in this project, in this document, China, this, um, the, the document says that China designed the clear project to remove the element of public sea from EEZ, right? 
and advance the direction to make EEZ more nationalized. Nationalized. Uh, it's so shocking towards a neighborhood country, in Japan. Uh, and uh, the, do you know this concept of blue territory? So the, for a Chinese point of view, that um, a sea, uh, the territory water, connecting water and the EZ, are the part, uh, are the uh, like land territory. This map is so uh, sim symbolic. The, all the um, South China Sea or the, 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 the designed similar to the land territory. And the next, next one, this is the second important document in a two, two, 2003, the summary of the design of national maritime economy development, this document. This document also strengthened uh, the aim of this strategy is just economy, economic development. And also the, the main part of the, this project is uh, basically located at the domestic ports at that time. That's in a 2000, 2003, under the Fujian period. However, uh, this is a new one. The, the 13th five years project. In this study project, the, uh, that, that project has the, the design of national maritime economy development. This project designed in a 2017 under the Xi, Jin, Xi Jinping administration. This, this, pro, this project mentioned about the expansion of the advancement of the, uh, their maritime activities toward all over the world. The previous one strengthened the importance in the domestic building, domestic port, okay. However, the project in 2017 advanced the world. So advancing to build foreign maritime key ports, advancing the cooperation among the international ports, supporting the company, supporting the companies to manage large international ports, to advance internationalization, participating and making a commit commitment with the management of foreign international ports, like Piraeus in Greek and Hamburg in Germany, protection of maritime rule and so on. So Costco, Costco and the other Chinese companies uh, advancing their projects basically under these docu basic documents. Xi Jinping said that China has to, China aim to be a much more, much more larger maritime power Okay. And also China wants to get the, some governance, maritime governance all over the world. It's a clear, yeah, it's not a secret, they said, okay. And also they, Chinese, China also advanced the other projects on the maritime governance. For example, they, they uh, aim to collect the data of all sciences from the zero, uh, geo uh, magnetism, seabed and the ocean clan and the sea surface and the land surface and the airflow and so on. So recently the Chinese other balloons are so famous. However, they sent so many ships all over the world. And also they send those balloons and also they launch so many satellites to get so many, many data of gold, uh, all sciences. Yeah, for the military project and the economic project and so on. The aim is so various, but uh, this is the, the uh, symbol of the uh, global power in, power in the world. Yeah, uh, and also how, how, how do they, they think the uh, maritime power or the, how do they get their geopolitical design of the maritime security? It's so simple, it's so simple. The threat of for China comes from East, basically USA. And the Malacca Canal and such some key key canals are the uh, choke point uh, from China, for, for China and the uh, energy security and the food security and so on. Uh, so China wants to uh, uh, keep the uh, or uh, keep the some safety to get the energy or the, the they want to keep the sea lanes and so on. So they think that if if something happened in East China Sea, South China Sea, or Western Pacific, how does they, how does China keep the sea lane from the Middle East or Africa or the Central Asia, it's about the energy, oils and so on. So they, 
got some ports in uh, Myanmar and they blow the pipelines. And those they got pipelines in Central Asia. So they are preparing so many because if, if China will, will be faced with some incident in the South China Sea, East China Sea or Taiwan, it is maybe it will be impossible to import something from Malacca Canal or East China, South China Sea. So they want to get some routes from the Indian Ocean. And also China has to keep some ports in the Indian Ocean or other areas to keep their chains of transportation all over the world. So the military expansion is also, however, they also think about such a, a to, to, a, to keep the sea lanes all, all over the world for the energy supply chain and so on. So the uh, history is interesting. This is Xi Jinping's uh, mind about the security. So they, Xi Jinping proposed such a, a various and uh, a diverse security concept. The security is connecting with, connecting with the economy, connecting with politics, connecting with biology and the environment. And so everything relating to the security. And the priority just set on the security. So the, between the economy and the security, security, the level of security is higher than the economy. This is Xi Jinping's point of view. Uh, in this chart, we can find some, yes, the C, the, especially uh, talk about, the, 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 uh, mentioned about like a C, C and the bottom of the C and so on. Yeah, and the China, and also the after getting the uh, some sea lanes and the Chinese PLA Navy go through the ports. Like the, the, the new, the, the Navy fleets go through the uh, Hong Kong and, the, and uh, uh, Indonesia and the Colombo and so on, Africa and others. So at the first they expand economically, but after the economy, the politics and the military will go uh, the bronze uh, after the economy. So economic nationalism, <laughs> you maybe understand the Hamburg cases and the PDO's cases. But I mentioned one point. <laughs> if we check the Pireus case, the Greek case, uh, Kosk Kosk actually did uh, participate into the management of PPA, Pireus Port Authority, SA. Uh, but uh, after the Kosk's commitments, the uh, improvement, of pro improvement of performance and the cargo handling volume and the financial turnaround and the productivity also improvement. Improve, improve so much. So we, we can we can mention about some threat or some 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 problems in Chinese expansion. However, economically speaking, sometimes sometimes we can find such a improvement after the Costco and some Chinese um, companies commitment or the management of these parts and, that, and other uh, some, some a uh, something a car, cargo hunting uh, or something. So I, I like to say that. Uh, so if we want to understand the Chinese port strategy and the real, uh, their real policy, we have to check the, uh, their each, each cases, each cases. Actually, there are so many, there are, uh, there are various, so many, many cases, and also each case a different situation. So we have to check the as many, many cases to understand the Chinese strategy. So uh, this is <laughs> as in my advertisement, actually. Uh, we uh, Japanese scholars have run one project, the analysis on the implication of Chinese economic op operation. And uh, we, we put so many data of the Chinese uh, ports and the uh, roads and uh, it, some uh, uh, train and airport and so on. We put, put them. And also, uh, we made a data set of a Chinese some, some economic uh, economic uh, projects in the world. Uh, so there's, so there's so many cases in Europe, and uh, basically in uh, Eastern Europe, and uh, maybe the uh, Southeast Asia, the Mecca of the Chinese project. And also, each case is, each case has seen these data, a project, main name project, and uh, a start point, and also finance cost shipping. 
and also the uh, amount of the Chinese investment and so on. So we have to pile up the cases and also to make analysis. So we can we can talk about so many, many bad cases, but uh, the other side, the China also sometimes the Chinese is pro so proud of China can improve the situation of the management of the port in the world. Yes, we, we know, I, we can find such cases. However, we can also find the bad case. How do we, yes, unify the all over the cases, but it is impossible. We, we anal analyze all the cases. So anyway, <laughs> we have to make a cooperation to uh, collect the materials, collect the data, and also the, 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 make, uh, make a, a discussion together. Uh, so this is my my, my small small, small uh, short presentation. If you have any question, I can ask. I, I can. Um, I really, I'm really uh, willing to discuss in this point with you. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, so much, Professor Shin, uh, for insightful um, introduction. I will come back to you and, um, but let's uh, give some floor to Professor Richard Griffins, who uh, published and also edited books about. Uh, Southern Asian region when, where a lot of interesting dynamics are also going on. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'll deal with Asia, but I won't deal with it exclusively. I want to make one point. If we start our analysis with China, the answer will always be with China. If we start our analysis with ports, we might get a different answer. I want to make a couple of observations. About 30 years ago, almost all the ports in the world were run by local governments or provincial governments. Now, the container ports, 80% of the ports in the world are run by the private sector. So there's been a big switch over. In other words, companies run ports rather than provinces or uh, municipalities. And generally, they do it better. So let's look at the second question. Why would a company want to buy a port? Well, some of them say we'd like to buy a port, we'll specialize in ports. China Merchant Ports specializes in ports. DP Weld from Dubai specializes in ports. Eurogate in uh, the Netherlands in ports. Hutchison, Hong Kong specializes in ports. PSA Singapore specializes in ports. So some firms say, right, we're going to build a port. We're not worried about the shipping. We're going to run this port as efficiently as possible and put our money into that. There are other firms that say, we'll stick to shipping. That's what we're best at. Let's somebody else build the ports because that way we can leave our investment in ships and not tie it up in ports. And if you're a carrier, you buy some ships, you rent some ships, you keep some flexibility. You tie up less of your capital. Evergreen from Taiwan does that. K-Line and Mol, NYK, Japan, are not involved in ports. And then you've got some crossovers, hybrid. Uh, Maersk, the Danish uh, shipping company, second, third in the world, runs through AP Muller, the Dutch side, operates ports, both. Um, CMA, CMG, which is an Italian uh, based firm, now the largest uh, uh, container carrier in the world, runs with TIL, Terminal International Limited, runs ports. And Costco runs ports. Why do these three groups run ports and shipping lines? Because the value of a container starts when it's sent and ends when it arrives at the consignee. If you can capture more along that value chain, then you get more income from moving containers. So Costco, which has got involvement in the European, in the um, Asian, Russia, uh, Europe lines on rail, obviously think it can back run that and then link up its supply chain in China with the ports that it controls, and then through to the other end. Um, Maersk APM trying to do the same. So it's not unusual that private sectors want to get ships and get ports. It's not unusual that China wants to do it. And if you look at China's position in the world, it accounts for about 18% of the world's maritime trade. But it doesn't control 18% of the throughput in ports. It doesn't control 18% of the world's shipping. In other words, if you look at China objectively, it is underrepresented. If you look at the United States, which is responsible for 16% of the world's merchandise traffic, you see it's almost invisible in port ownership and in international shipping. 
problem with America is not that China is so big, it's that America is so underrepresented in this. On the other hand, the Greeks own the ships, uh, the Dutch and the uh, Italians own a bunch of ports. We're overrepresented on that side. So basically, if we look at China's involvement, we have to go port by port. And let's go through some of them. The uh, String of Pearls, the three basically useless ports in the Indian Ocean. The port in uh, Myanmar has not got a rail link. It hasn't got a highway link. It pumps gas from a small oil gas field off the coast. And it has two dolphins outside that connect up with oil. You're not going to solve China's oil boycott going through that net. You'll get uh, oil to Kunming. And why would you do that? Because it's damn sight easier to sham ship it from there than to go all the way around the coast of uh, Southeast Asia, through the Straits, all the way back up the other side, and then send your oil all the way back to Kunming. In other words, there is good economic sense in doing that. Pampantota in Sri Lanka. It didn't want the port, it took it over. A Chinese firm uh, went in, probably hoping to get the good graces of the Chinese government by saying we've intervened. What is there? There's no highway linking it. There's no railway linking it. It's on the edge of a jungle. There's a small thing. And all of they got a big car park. What does it use it for? Transshipping cars, landing them there, putting them on smaller ships, shipping them elsewhere. Look at Piraeus, um, not Piraeus, Gwadra in Pakistan, the jewel of the Pakistan-China economic corridor. No Chinese line goes there. It gets barely one or two ships a week. It has no highway, no railway linking direct to China. And these are what we're afraid of because we put China first, Indian Ocean next, screen security, and we got the answer. Where haven't we been looking? Look at Colombo, China investment there in building the financial city alongside the port. Look at Karachi, where China is proposing to expand the port and the World Bank is happy to lend money to build the bridge to avoid the construction congestion around the port. We don't seem to worry about that, but what's the difference between Karachi and Guadra? One is a fairy story myth, the wicked evil aunts or whatever, which and the other is a commercial base and a commercial view. Go into Europe, you get the same story. Nobody made China by uh, Piraeus. Nobody wanted Piraeus. Germany preferred to invest in the airport rather than in the port. So China has moved in and done a very good job of it. Why is China in Zeebrugge? Because Maersk sold off Zeebrugge, so we don't want it because we're expanding and concentrating in Rotterdam. Why is China in Rotterdam? Because the Dutch government said, sorry, Mert, you can't have such a large share of Rotterdam. You've got to sell some of it. China buys. As long as every time China moves commercially, we see it as an aggressive move, we can build up a huge security story. Once we look at it case by case and look at it from commercial interests and separate these prejudices in advance, then I think you can get a much more nuanced picture. I'll stop there. Um, thank you so much. We can, of course, continue uh, these topics. And thanks a lot for those interesting details. They are very important in the story. Um, well mentioned above states are mostly um, related to global south, of course, except for maybe Greece, um, where China, when China is also an important investor in developed, developed economies, mentioned Greece, but also uh, we have a case of Israel. Um, especially that um, when we were looking at public opinion barometers globally, positive sentiments toward China were rather shrinking, while in Israel, they seemed to be relatively high and even improving. So this is a very interesting context of, uh, of Haifa pods, which will be presented by Mr. Um, Yehud Tegonen. Thank you. So I will just uh, share my share my presentation. Um,
Yeah, good, good morning again. So um, I would like to present to you a, a research that we conducted at the University of Haifa uh, uh, that actually measured the response of uh, recipient countries to uh, outgoing by their, their investment from China into the seaport. So basically, we uh, looked at the uh, economic perspective, looking at the uh, uh, economic and social re uh, response to the uh, Chinese uh, uh, foreign direct investments. Those investments uh, from um, academic perspective are quite unique because they present a flow of investments from developing countries, uh, which is a phenomenon. There are uh, investment coming from India, from Brazil, from mainly from China. So this is relatively a new phenomenon of investment going from the developing world into the, the developed world, and uh, also uh, heavy governmental involvement. Um, if we will have a, a literature review about what concern countries uh, regarding the Chinese investments uh, in seaports, so we can group it basically into uh, six uh, groups. There is the strategic uh, sectors uh, as ports, uh, uh, energy, et cetera, that are concerned countries. The financial uh, huge uh, program, uh, two to four trillions US dollars, depend on the how do you define the investments, the implementation by uh, state-owned uh, uh, organizations, uh, uh, state-owned companies. Uh, the directors of those companies are usually uh, Chinese uh, member ch members of the Chinese Communist parties. Uh, there is the funding through government uh, 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 banks and the dual use of uh, um, commercial and uh, military use. So if we, again, look at the literature about the response to the Chinese investments, so you can group the concerns along those uh, six uh, groups. Uh, so basically, I'm re repeating now uh, some of the other speakers' uh, uh, issues that th there is some tension between political uh, um, goals of those investments and economic goals. And basically, what we try to, to map in our research is how do countries a response to, to those uh, investments according to those two, uh, let's call them lines, economic and uh, uh, political lines. So basically, just again, to summarize the research, there are, there's China, there's uh, investments coming out, to, out, out of China into different countries. Those countries have different characteristics as democracy, uh, openly uh, globalization, Open to globalization, GDP per capita, or the poor region, other other uh, uh, aspects of countries, and those countries are actually responding to China. Uh, how do we uh, measure the response? Uh, so again, on the left side, uh, we saw we see the characteristics of countries: you know, democracy, uh, global glo globalization index, uh, cultural proximity to China, etc. And on the right side, we see the different columns. So we see trade. Uh, tourism going to China, uh, UN General Assembly voting, public perception on China, investment into China, etc. So basically, we developed uh, a database that uh, have uh, all the investments in seaports around the world and try to look at the response of countries to the investments before and after. So it is after an investment in the countries, let's say if those countries are characterized by high democracy in the, uh, index, is the trade is going up or down? Is tourism going up and down, etc., based on uh, the timeline of the investments? Uh, so we developed a, a database, and I will be very happy to, to share some uh, data with our uh, uh, Japanese partner over here. I understand that you did something similar. Uh, we located the 94 terminals in 25 countries, uh, and each one of those terminals have a double, uh, a, a dual independent sources. Uh, for for its existence, because if you look at the media, it looks like country, uh, China is buying half of the terminals in the world. And this is not the case, but but yet 94 terminals are quite a lot. Uh, and we put them on a map as well. If you look at the timeline of those uh, uh, purchases of terminal, you see definitely starting with the announcements of the uh, Belt and Road Initiative of the BRI in 2013, increase in the number of players and in the number of deals. Uh, and now I will, um, uh, we, I think a very interesting uh, issue is the alignment with the UN General Assembly voting. So um, there are reports like, like those reports about uh, countries uh, align the diplomatic uh, uh, 
uh, announcements and uh, voting with China uh, because of those investments. There are not so many cases like this, but we check this as well. So we actually uh, coded the voting uh, pattern in the, uh, of, of, um, of all the countries compared to China. China is uh, in this chart, for example, is, is the zero, is the X, uh, X exit, and, and we compare the, the voting along the years uh, with China, and this is some example of, for example, Israel and the US on the right side, or European countries on the other side, and look if there are any changes in those voting patterns before and after receiving uh, investments into, into the port. And some, uh, we, we did a very comprehensive uh, statistical analysis, uh, including different statistics models, and basically those are the preliminary uh, results that I would like to share with you. Uh, the, what we see over here it, with a minus is a negative response, which means decreasing. Me, we don't see the slides. We don't see the slides moving. So if you could, can share it again, because we don't see, no, we have only seen the first slide. Okay, thank oh, you. really? So, <laughs> okay. Now it's perfect. Uh, can you see it now? Can you see it now, please? Yeah, I can see this one. Yes. Okay. So, so basically, you can see. So, I apologize for for the other uh, other side. There, there was a full presentation. So, uh, so basically, uh, this is the summarize of the of the of the of the research. Uh, so again, we have on the left side, we have the characteristic of the countries according to uh, um, the political and economic parameters like democracy, integration, integration into the globalized uh, economic system, GDP per capita, and other cultural uh, proximity to China, etc. And we can see basically the uh, negative or positive reaction. The negative, it means reducing in trade or reducing the amount of tourism going to China. Positive, it means increasing. And what we see is basically that if we look, we, we do see some, uh, for example, negative reaction in the public opinion in uh, countries that are aligned politically with the US, such as NATO members and, and, and others. Uh, but I think that what is very clear over here that uh, this is a very uh, economically motivated responses. So countries that are poor with low GDP, usually after receiving investments into ports, they increase the trade with China significantly. There are more tourism coming. Uh, the public uh, perception on China is is, is getting uh, more positive. Uh, and what is inter was interested for me as an economist that uh, countries that are highly uh, integrated into the globalized world with a high uh, globalization index score uh, basically have a, a negative reaction, a, a significant negative reaction along different sectors. So trade, tourism. A political dimension of the UNGA uh, voting, etc., cetera. Um, um, and we can discuss why this is happening. Maybe those countries, of course, of course there is some correlation between uh, those countries and NATO members or EU members, but uh, uh, when we're talking about ports, we're talking about uh, issues that should increase globalization, increase trade, and we see a negative response from those kind of countries. So if I have to summarize, so in our very, very comprehensive uh, research that uh, took a few years, cover all the known terminals uh, investment, uh, invested by China around the world, covering uh, more than seven uh, major parameters of response and covering more than seven characteristic of uh, countries uh, that response. Uh, we see those uh, uh, responses that are mainly, as if I can should generalize it, uh, mainly economic response and not a political response. Thank you very much. Thank you a lot. It seems that uh, there are a lot of uh, similar elements between Japanese and um, Israeli research, uh, including also big data, web scraping, and et cetera, those kind of technologies. Um, of course, uh, we have um, time for a second round when, um, of course, you can uh, also share additional slides. And if you have uh, additional comments and questions to each other and or also add some something else um he, here is also a moment for a second round professor shin if you would like to ask anything okay thank you so much uh, uh, first of all uh, the uh 
Mr. Richards, uh, Griffiths, you mentioned about the uh, Guadal and the uh, Hanban Tuta case. How do you evaluate these cases? Because, they, for example, yes, it, it's true, China yes, got, got the uh, management uh, for the 20, uh, 99 years of the Hanban Tuta, but China actually does not use the Hanban Tuta a militarily, and uh, economically speaking, China does not use the uh, Hanban Tuta port at, at present now. What's the aim of, uh, what is the Chinese aim to uh, get the uh, Hanban Tuta and uh, this port? I think it is clear of the uh, Guadalupe case. As you said, uh, after China got the, the Guadalupe port and also the, then China wants to get some uh, some lanes from the port to the Pakistan and the Central Asia, but uh, China failed it. <laughs> it is not successfully done. But uh, how do you see the, the especially about the Hamba Tuta case? What's the aim of China? Okay, thank you. I think China, uh, China, Chinese merchant ports acquired Hamba Tuta almost by accident. Thought, okay, there was a problem. It was for sale. The government was in trouble, debt problem, not by China, just generally in debt problem. Nobody else is dealing with Sri Lanka because of the civil war. You don't realize whenever you leave a vacuum, somebody moves in. Well, China was there. Nobody else is willing to lend. Then all of a sudden there's trouble and China Merchant Port says, look, you know, we'll take over that port. We'll release the, the data, we'll build the port up and the Chinese government will smell beneficently, great, this is nice, increases our footprint in uh, Sri Lanka. Yes, Excellent. Sir. Thank you so much. It is building. I mean, as I say, it's surrounded by jungle. Um, it's going to build a cruise shipping stop mm. in Humboldt Tota, which might be nice. You can go and see some elephants and things. Play cricket, by the way. It's got a very big cricket stadium because uh, China thought that that would be nice there as well. Mm. And you'll see a major hub for transshipment. Not of goods, because that is far better done in Colombo, where all of the agglomeration, the infrastructure is already there. But all you need to transfer cars is a big space to park cars. There's nothing else there except jungle. So they've got a big space to park cars. Twice a week, um, a car carrier will come and stop there and offload a load of cars. And with China moving into electric cars is probably going to do more of that. They'll then go on to smaller transshipment things, be sent to the Middle East, send possibly to India. Yeah. That's the role of Hamban Tota. Mm -hmm. Guadra was almost got by accident. It was given to China, China messed it up, given to Italy, that messed up, came back to China, got put into the Belt and Road Authority, etc. Huge political statements made about it, nothing much happening. Why? Well, there's resistance from Pakistan itself. They can't get 40 hectares of, of Pakistani naval land, for example. It's still owned by the Navy, and we're, we're 20 years further on. So there's obviously some pushback there. Um, mm. There's a low-level civil war going on. And so China's taken that into account. Most of the investments in the China-Pakistan economic corridor are in the east of Pakistan, not in the west. So rather than build a road directly up to uh, Kashgar, which you think would be logical, right. or a railway up there, they're building a road to Karachi. Mm -hmm. Next thing, the, the road, the highway to Karachi, not going directly up, then it will collect up with the rest of the highway, and eventually it'll get to China. Mm -hmm. At the moment, virtually nothing comes down. It's not even on Costco's list to have a visit there. So it picks up low-level trade, mostly with the coast of Africa, um, and very little volume. It doesn't even count as a container port, even though it's got container equipment. The container ships don't go there in large measure. Yeah. Um, yeah, and these things happen. Um, and okay, it could be when Karachi is full in 20 years' time, there's a nice site and it will develop it then. It could be that military commercial balances have changed and perhaps a deep water port can come along. But that's all in the future. And when we put that as our main security concern, mm -hmm. then you look at the reality against that, mm -hmm. you say they have no operational capability at all in naval terms in 
any of those three thoughts that everybody so worries about in the uh, literature, mm. then you have to say, well, what's, the, what's driving the analysis? Is the analysis being driven by decline of big power status and so will fit everything to the narrative? But if you look, I don't see the danger. I don't see the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, may I ask you one more question to, to Mr. Uh, Professor Udi, Udi Konen? Um, yes, uh, as I said, the um, China really has its own strategy, and also the uh, I also propose one as a humble case. Uh, German, Germ Germany has uh, enough power to control the Chinese investment under twenty five percent. However, as you know, the so called so called global first countries, if the economic uh, the economy of the budget is was uh, not so strong, the the global South, some developing countries cannot control Chinese investment, especially if they aim to, uh, yes, advance the so-called economic development. They really need the Chinese investment. So I, I want to, so many countries, Southeast Asia and uh, Southeast Asia and African countries, and I also interviewed some uh, local officials and the politicians. They said, they also understand the so-called debt trap, debt trap. However, no other countries, yes, without China, do not make such a huge investment, like a, to to build to build ports or trains and so on. So China is the only one choice for these countries for their economic development. So how do we, European countries and Japan also the advanced countries to Yes, support these developing countries. Actually, Japan has not does not have enough money <laughs> to support these countries. So, how do we, yeah, you know, cope with this situation? This is my question. Well, this is a one trillion dollar question, I guess. Um, uh, I think that as a response to the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, there are other responses that are try, trying to mimic some of the uh, some of those uh, initiatives, like uh, the Indian uh, South uh, South North uh, Corridor and in Africa, etc. But I think that you are absolutely right. There is there was a vacuum. The international banks, like the Asian Development Bank, World Bank, etc., the model of development didn't suit to all countries. And the Chinese model entered in between. And uh, I think it's uh, applicable for some countries. Uh, because it uh, does not uh, connect the political liberalization with the economic liberalization. So for some countries, it is a very uh, interesting model that allowed them to develop uh, uh, financially and economically without a liberalized uh, economic system. So, so, so this is what is unique about the, the Chinese development uh, model. And I think um, as, as we go on, I think, uh, especially after the corona, some, uh, there is some awakeness uh, of, uh, some of those uh, countries from the, this dream that it can be uh, done. That, that's my perspective. Maybe it's a Western perspective, but that's my perspective. Uh, and, uh, and I think um, uh, we are going into a kind of a new Cold War that's, uh, that, that will uh, be shown in the investment in, in infra infrastructure as well. And if I may allow to, to comment on the other, other, uh, other questions, uh, in uh, political science, we have this issue called the uh, security dilemma. This is the basic uh, uh, dilemma uh, for any country. And, and uh, I think there's no question that the motivation of China in, in investments uh, going back 10 years ago, et cetera, was economic. There's no question about it. China has the, to, to import its energy, to import its food, it wants to control the, the, the logistic chains. There's no, no question about the economic motivation. But once those infrastructure are there, once you control the ports, once, once you integrated, uh, 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 integrated the shipping with the ports, actually you control the whole value chain from manufacturing, through logistics, through shipping, through ports, through marketing channels into, the, into your market. So uh, there is a, a very, let's call it, a, a very good opportunity to use those infrastructure that was built from economic perspective to use it for political uh, 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 issues and the scales of time here is important i fully uh, agree with, with mr richard uh, observation about every investment as, as separate totally and totally agree with this and i'm familiar with those cases but i think that we have to look at the perspective of, of, of few generation you build those those infrastructure for 
for, for generations, for, for 20, 30, 50 years. And I think the, the motivation of the Chinese government to use them as a political leverage is, is, is high. And we know this academically and theoretically from the, the, uh, the security dilemma uh, uh, model, which is quite quite basic model in political science. So, so I think, um, uh, again, we have to look at also a different time when we discuss uh, about the uh, effects of those uh, investments. Thank you very much. I, I'd like to make a couple of comments, partly coming back on your comments just now, uh, Udi, and partly to come into your database in a minute. I think we need to separate China's investments in raw material ports, where they are really linked up, and they are also the main buyers of the raw materials because they're the main man manufacturers in the world, and that facilitates the flow from the container ports, which it deals with a more diverse set of manufactured goods. Secondly, we've got to stop talking about China in Hamburg, China in Rotterdam. China is part of a terminal, one terminal in Rotterdam out of several, and not even the major part of that terminal. Piraeus, it has 100%, but nobody wanted Piraeus. And okay, it has an influence in the south of Greece, but the EU is also contributing development funds to the development of the port of Piraeus. You know, it's, it's not a, a, a win-lose situation that's cast there. Zeebrugge, yeah, they've got 85% of the terminal in Zeebrugge, but Zeebrugge is not the major port. Antwerp is. Zeebrugge is a through port going through to the United Kingdom. And Costco has a small regional line that's registered in Europe that allows it to do this transshipment. Otherwise, it couldn't do it. We don't have the same facilities, by the way, in China. So if we're going to renegotiate, that's what we need to open up, our ability to do short-haul trade within China, because China has that ability through Costco subsidy in Europe. Um, so Rotterdam, not fully owned. Antwerp, not fully owned. Hamburg, again, one terminal, not three others, and only 25% of it. What are we doing here in this discourse? Piraeus, 100%, fine. 50% in Bilbao and Valencia. That's the other large section. Some of the other ports are small. Vado, ships, refrigerated containers, less than 20,000, 30,000 a year. And we put that alongside Piraeus or alongside Rotterdam and say there's another Chinese interest. No wonder policymakers in NATO get worried because every number just increases incrementally. Now, I was wondering in your database, if you were to separate the, the raw material ports from the more diffuse trade, whether you wouldn't see a different form in trade. The second thing I worry about is why, and I've supervised PhD theses that do a lot on China's soft power influence through investment, the West has been pumping vastly more than China is pumping into development aid for 30, 40 years. What thanks does it get from it? What is its reputation in Africa and in authoritarian regimes in South America? Nowhere in sight. So why on earth we should expect an investment in a port to have some influence on democracy as a positive. I mean, your, your dimensions are wrong. There are lots of other things that have an influence on democracy that might actually influence why you want someone like China ask no questions, build a port for you. But building a port is not going to influence the level of democracy in a country. Um, it's this distortion of um, the size of the effect and the size of the propulsion to the effect that you can't fully capture in this statistical correlation package, which is why I think it needs to be broken down further. And even then, I doubt whether you'll get that clear results um, at sort of 95% certainty. But I'd love to come and talk to you at some stage yes. with your database and yes. actually see what you've okay. got. I Self-publicity, because it's free on uh, Academia Edu. I, several years ago, I wrote a book called Configuring the World that basically spends most of its time tearing into composite indices and tearing them apart. It's free on Academia Edu to load down. So uh, if you want it, you can get it there. And that's my attitude. I'm very skeptical of these sort of statistical exercises and basically skeptical of the composite indices that then become a truth um, and that is then used as a proxy for something you can't measure in the first place. 
And, uh, if I may just uh, answer to this, so so the the research is, is have two parts. Part is the is statistic, and part is the case study in of Haifa and Piraeus. Actually, so I was traveling to Piraeus two times and interview also uh, people in in Israel. So I will present this in the second part of this uh, seminar. But basically, we we checked the other way around. So we we didn't check if the port in, uh, uh, affect democracy. We checked does if in democratic countries that receive investments the trade increase or decrease or more tourists going to China or less tourists come, come, uh, going to China. Uh, and as, as you, you are absolutely right, this is a statistics uh, uh, analyst, but uh, I think it's uh, the results are going uh, very well with, with the literature review. And uh, if we dip in and, and, and look, uh, uh, actually we see this, uh, what what what, we just, what you just say that the countries with low GDP per capita tend to to increase more positively. So actually, we we agree on this thing. So so they look at the, those investments as as a as a developing tool as a as a possible income for for foreign uh, currency. Uh, and I fully agree with you that uh, 50 years of uh, Western aid into Africa didn't give any roads, just gave fishes. I, I agree. With, I agree with this uh, statement, maybe as well. If, if I may translate what what you just said, so um, uh, stop here, and I will be happy to share more information uh, on privately channel. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, it's really an amazing portion of knowledge, and we have to digest it before a Q and A session, which will happen soon. But maybe you have like um, last remarks and comments. I know that uh, Mr. Gon Gonan showed us also as I think slide eleven. There was a graph related to what you talked about. If you can share it now, and also we have a couple of more minutes about your some final remarks, and I will ask the audience to write their questions and comments in the chat. Preferably. Oh, should I, should I share the, the graph? Okay. Um, we saw the miniatures, and there was one one graph related to what you said. Did you test this, this graph? Yeah, so uh, um, uh, what what we showed or uh, showing over here is that uh, measuring trade and tourism is, is relatively easy. We're trying to measure um, a diplomatic alliance or alignment uh, is, is, is harder. And we use uh, quite a common uh, parameter, which is the coding of uh, United Nations General Assembly voting uh, data. Uh, and um, what, what you see basically over here, uh, China is the baseline, is the, is the zero, the x uh, axis. And you see the different uh, voting uh, pattern coded by, by in this uh, system. You have the reference uh, down, down below. Uh, so on the right side, you see uh, three countries, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Israel, and the United States. Again, China is the baseline. And you see that the US uh, in orange is the more uh, remote, uh, more than 3.5 points from the Chinese uh, uh, pattern. Israel is very much related and uh, uh, similar uh, to the US, while Kazakhstan, for example, is, is uh, much closer to, to the baseline to China. And on the left side, you see European voting uh, pattern, again, again, against the Chinese pattern, which is the zero. We, we see that most of European countries votes almost the same, uh, except of Britain, the highest uh, line over there. And uh, basically in the research, we try to see uh, if we can mark the year of investments uh, of China into uh, the recipient countries, that does we see a significant statistic, statistically significant changes in the voting pattern uh, toward China or toward uh, the US? Uh, and basically, the answer, generally speaking, the answer is no. So uh, until now, anyway, and some of the investments are quite long, few years already, uh, we haven't uh, found any uh, proof for significant. Uh, align, uh, alignment uh, with the Chinese voting by the recipient uh, countries. Thank you. Well, thanks so much. I'm happy we haven't missed it. Of course, uh, well, uh, quantitative research and qualitative research should, should be combined together when none of those spheres is, is perfect. Um, okay, uh, if there are some final 
remarks or comments before we open the floor to the audience. At the time, if not, uh, are there any uh, questions and comments from the audience? Uh, yeah, there is uh, one question in the chat uh, uh, from an from an expert from Ministry and a sinologist, um, and it's. Uh, are there any signs of co collusions in Africa between China's port operations and Russia's resources extractions? Uh, operations facilitated by Wagner Group, Darfur Central African Republic. My apologies, cannot go audio at the moment. So, and that's why it's in the chat. Uh, if any of experts have knowledge about this issue. Of course, we are in the part of the world that um, we're quite interested also in um, in Russia's activity. But of course, it might not be globally that relevant. So the, the question is, uh, Russia's activity in, in Central Africa? Oh. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could, um, there is a possibility to, to find any signals between cooperation between China and Russia in that aspect. Yes, yeah, so uh, we, 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 everybody knows that Russia has a strong uh, ties with the West, uh, Central and some African countries on the military cooperation. Yes, and uh, Russia provides some weapons and so on. However, uh, I also uh, checked some some cases, and I went to Africa to check some cases with China um, China's pro China project. But I cannot, I, I could not find any case to on a, a Russia Chinese co cooperation on China's project actually. So, uh, especially about the, some some uh, in infrastructure projects. So, if, if you 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 know some some cases of the. Uh, Russia and the Chinese cooperation on infrastructure building. It, it's, it, it is so it, it's just interesting. But recently, Chinese company in Africa, they, they only uh, got some a uh, public investment at this country. Not uh, they, they, Sometimes the Chinese company in Africa do not rely on the Chinese support, Chinese aid and others. So sometimes they only apply, uh, the Chinese company apply for them a uh, World Bank investment uh, aid or some other organization uh, aid and so on. So the, uh, the way of Chinese Chinese companies get some uh, projects or is getting more various and various in Africa, I think. So it is possible for us to find some cases um, that China uh, advanced some cooperation with Russia, but uh, I, I do not know. Thank you. I may note on this one. Um... Uh, not not on Central Asia, but in, in Egypt, which is the North, North Asia, the Suez Canal is a is a major uh, part of the Chinese uh, Belt and Road Initiative, a major uh, 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 component of it. And uh, China, uh, uh, beside of the port, is operating uh, two in, uh, very large industrial parks uh, along the Suez Canal. There are reports on the uh, Russia industrial park as well, and Russia investments along the Suez Canal. Uh, not in conjunction, but parallel to the Chinese one. And as far as I know, those uh, announcements were never materialized into uh, into uh, into real investments. So um, uh, in, in Egypt, is, uh, to, uh, as well as I know, there, there is no such a uh, cooperation. And this is the major part of the uh, the Belt and Road. Thank you. I suppose we're going to follow this argument. Then we should look at Iran. Again, a vacuum waiting to be filled. Who moves in? Russia offering billions and billions of programs. That's not real money. That's real statements projected. It was interesting that before the United States broke or abandoned that nuclear control treaty, that the Europeans were all over Iran with uh, modal points, railways, depots, et cetera. And then the double uh, sanctions that the United States imposed, it disappeared. So China moves in. If you want that link then from China then to Russia, 
when I'm reading of the drones now being supplied by Iran to Russia, um, then you're getting a triangle. Now, if there's any link between the triangle, um, that would be very difficult for Chinese foreign policy. I don't believe that there are. I tend to assume that China is not involved in arming uh, or even encouraging the arming of Russia at the moment. Another area I'm looking at, though, of Russia is the, uh, the Yamal gas fields in the north. They built one gas field already up there, and that's exporting natural gas, aimed initially towards Europe, because it, you've got a longer sailing season going to the west than you do to the east. Then in the second round, China and Korea, uh, sorry, Korea and Japan have got in involved in that investment, even so far as talking about building a port on the Russian end in order to transship the natural gas from the large ice-breaking carriers you need in the north to cheaper ones to run it through then to supply themselves. And I wonder there, what's going to happen? Yamal 3 is still in the talk stage, but Yamal 2 is being built. And I'm assuming that that's not going to go through with Western aid. And again, I think where China, where is a gap, China will fill the gap. So in other words, I can see China moving quite intensely into the development of the Arctic field, which will increase the NATO uh, worries about that area as a potential conflict zone uh, in the future as well. Oh, thank you so much. Um, uh, there is another um, this continuation of this topic of resources Russia. Is there any correlation between Chinese port investment and the intensity of Chinese um, illegal fishing in uh, in the waters? Um, the only knowledge I have comes from an excellent book called Outlaw Ocean, which I can recommend anybody to read if you haven't, and that stresses quite clearly that most of the illegal fishing is offloaded at sea, not on land, which is why I say to continue uh, so flagrantly. Also a very good book, but I haven't written it, but I do recommend it. Maybe on the, on the fishing uh, issue, uh, I'm not aware of any relate, relation between the fishing areas and the uh, port investment, but definitely there is a re relation between the fishing and the China greater maritime uh, strategy. The, the, fisher, uh, the fishing fleets that uh, is, uh, I think, more than a million uh, boats uh, is part of, my, uh, this is the blue militia, this is the, the blue, uh, the, the gray, it's the blue, blue little people. Uh, and this is part of the Chinese maritime strategy to show presence in, 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 some, in some areas. So I'm not aware of any connection to investments in port, but definitely there is a connection to the greater maritime strategy of uh, China. Yeah, uh, so I, I had one information about the uh, Chinese strategy on the fish, fishing, uh, especially in the uh, uh, southern part of the Pacific. Uh, China's aims are so clear. Saying the fishing ships are, are yes, uh, uh, captain the um, uh, part of the Pacific, and also recently China a uh, advancing as aid policy toward the island country in the South, uh, South Pacific. So, in, in some region in the in the world, that you are the in the port uh, building and the fishing fishing industries are combined. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, are there any other questions? If not, um, I think we can um, close the session. Uh, some of you were going to meet in part two about um, predominantly EU, but um, now um, I would like to thank again our experts for an excellent um, debate and introductions. And it was really an honor to host you. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you for arranging it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.